Okay, hi everyone. I am Megan Wells, Marketing Programs Manager at Insights. Welcome to our session today, Securing Healthcare, Attackers, Defenders, and Data. Thank you all for making the time to join us. Today, our Chief Security Officer, Itai Mayor, and Chief Compliance Officer, Chris Strand, are teaming up with Caleb Barlow and David Finn of Synergist Tech to discuss how threat actors are targeting healthcare providers. They will also cover where healthcare regulations and cybersecurity frameworks intersect and how they benefit from one another. Discussion will also include why clinics and hospitals should mature their cyber threat intelligence, instance response capabilities, and compliance assessment processes. If you have any questions throughout the session, please type them in the questions box and we'll do our best to cover them all at the end of the presentation. We'll also be sending the link to the recording of the webinar after the session today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Itai to kick things off. Thank you, Megan. Thank you everyone for uh, joining this session. I'm really excited uh, to kind of host this session along with uh, Caleb, David, and Chris. Um, so as Megan mentioned, uh, what we're going to do in the next roughly 45 minutes, uh, we wanna leave, make sure we leave time for some Q&A at the end, is we're gonna take a look at security uh, in healthcare. Uh, but we're gonna try to approach it from several different uh, uh, kinds of, kind of point of views. Uh, we'll share information about the type of information that threat actors target when it comes to healthcare uh, providers uh, and clinics, healthcare institutions, uh, and then go a little bit deeper into the type of information which is available pretty easily on the clear and deep web. We'll also do a dive into, into the dark web and take a look at some of the offerings that criminals have on the dark web when it comes to uh, healthcare systems, whether it's uh, uh, personal identifiable information, information about patients or information about drugs. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, we'll also share a couple of uh, case studies and talk a little bit about uh, what can be done to uh, mature uh, the security strategy for uh, healthcare providers and healthcare organizations. Uh, as you can see, we have a, a great group here today. Uh, we're all gonna be uh, discussing these uh, issues. Uh, so I actually do wanna jump into uh, the first slide here to kind of have everybody, uh, give everybody a chance to introduce themselves, some of their background uh, and what they do. So we'll go from top to bottom, um, Caleb. Sure, Caleb Barlow, I'm the uh, CEO at Synergistic and just full disclosure, Itai and I have actually worked together in a prior job. So we'll probably have a little fun on today's webinars. We've certainly worked together before, but uh, we're really hoping to bring some uh, varying expertise to the table across our panel here of experts. And I'm David Fee, and I'm the EVP of Strategic Innovation at Synergistic. Uh, I am a recovering healthcare CIO as well as privacy and security officer, uh, so don't hold my age against me. Thanks, David. Hey, this is Christopher Strand, I'm the Chief Compliance Officer here at Insights. Um, it, you know, I, I, I spent a great deal of time in 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 in, uh, in traditionally computer programming and engineering, and then really gravitated towards this, uh, um, you know, this spending time in data security compliance and regulatory. So I guess as David's recovering, I'm also a recovering uh, IT auditor, uh, moved into full-blown security and whatnot, and you know, really, really looking for a way to join the disparate teams between uh, between security and compliance, and and hopefully getting them working towards the same or, or working against the same data towards their collective goals and so that's really uh that's led me into uh, working on these uh, types of uh, against security assessments and whatnot a broad, wide variety of uh, uh, industries across retail healthcare finance and uh, you know most recently working in the retail industry for uh, and with the pci dss so much of that experience is is really relevant to our discussion today i think and uh, definitely on security of, of healthcare and and just to round it out, I'm really honored to speak today with uh, obviously with my colleague Itai and and with Caleb and David uh, from Synergist Tech on this very important and timely subject. Great, and um, I'm Itai Moore, I'm the Chief Security Officer at Insights. Uh, as Caleb mentioned, uh, we work together uh, at IBM. 
um, Caleb was being nice about it. He was my boss at, at IBM, but we will not hack into his mobile device today and show where he lives as part of our demonstration, something I learned I probably shouldn't do without giving a heads up. Uh, instead, uh, we will look at what the uh, cyber criminals are doing in the uh, clear, deep, and dark web and how that affects uh, healthcare organizations. So actually, I, I wanted to start this discussion by talking first a little bit about why criminals are targeting healthcare, because we'll get into into the how uh, through most of these slides. Uh, but at first, why are they even doing it? And when we with, were discussing uh, uh, the, these issues, we discussed the, inf the fact that the information is immutable and contains many, many data sets. So when you look at the type of information that healthcare organizations have, uh, they have a lot of information that can be used and we'll see in a, in a minute for different types of attacks. Um, Usually when you think about uh, a retailer, for example, well, they mostly, most of the time they would just hold your credit card information and probably not a lot more than that credit card, maybe an email. When you look at the healthcare records that have been uh, leaked, ransomed, sold in the criminal underground, you see a vast, a vast uh, like variety of, of different types of data that can be used for all kinds of, of types of uh, attacks from, uh, social security information, research data, uh, drug intellectual uh, property. Uh, some of these, I'm actually, in some cases, I can tell from my personal experience, I don't even understand uh, uh, why they're there. And, and Caleb, I, I think we also discussed this a, a couple of years back when we talked about these things that, you know, when I go to my doctor today and I get the form to sign up for a service, they would ask me all kinds of questions about my medical history, but then they'll go into the private information. And I remember one specific case where I was asked to give a social security number for a doctor visit that it was my first time. And I never wrote it down. I felt unsecure giving it on a piece of paper to somebody. And I handed it over to uh, the, uh, uh, the secretary, the lady who was managing all the, the, the uh, paperwork. And you know what happened when she saw that the social security wasn't there? Nothing. She didn't say anything. And so I asked her, well, you asked for this, why are you not asking me for the social security number? She said, oh, it's fine. If you don't want to give it, then don't give it to us. I was like, wow, <laughs> then why are we taking this information and holding it? And how, how do you guys approach the fact that, you know, we see so much information when it comes to the current underground and the stuff that's being sold? Well, you know, Itai, I think one of the things that we have to think about, particularly in a healthcare setting, is what information do you actually need to render service? Now, the unfortunate challenge with the social security number is that it's often used as a unique identifier for insurance purposes. And, you know, one of the kind of soapbox uh, items I've been on for years is convincing insurers to actually use some other form of identification rather than a social security number. But of course, the challenge is, isn't that we use social security numbers for identity. It's when we also use a social security number for access, meaning, oh, tell me the last four digits of your social to get into this system. Social security number is really an identity form. It really should never be used for access. But I think to answer your question, Itai, the real question that providers and clinicians need to ask themselves, do I need this information and do I really want to store it? Because we need to look at all data as being somewhat nuclear. And if you don't need it, for treating the patient now or in the future, why are you keeping it around? That's a great question, Itai, and, and it points to the bigger issue, and that is we've never understood uh, individually or in healthcare the value of that data. So when I started in healthcare, it was uh, the social security number was a unique identifier and the medical records were filed based on SSN, and we kind of outgrew that but even today for Medicare and Medicaid, and Medicare has only made the change in the last two years, you get a different Medicare number. It used to be your social security number, and so it had tax implications, but we've got to stop thinking about giving data out and think about the value of that data and why they really need it and what they're gonna do with it. You're absolutely right. And you know what, I'll, I'll just add one more thing to that. Um, so on, on, the, uh, on the topic of the business use of the data and how that's used and how it can, how it can implicate you from, from a threat perspective, um, Itai was making the comparison between uh, retail and, 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 and healthcare and what he's used to on both sides of the business process like that. And then the business use that Kayla was talking about, I think it's important um, to note that a lot of this data can also merge into other types of, 
of security problems across a variety of, uh, of let's say, regulatory functions. And you know, cyber criminals often know that they can leverage that data to create um, liability uh, within other segments and regulatory sectors. What I'm getting at is, um, so you know, if healthcare data is stolen, it can usually affect the validity of other data security concerns. And, and I saw this very often uh, related to healthcare. Um, uh, that uh, there was also, you know, um, many businesses were also subject uh, to to many various information privacy regulations. For example. Uh, as well as those that had to adhere to, let's say, uh, in my case, working with retailers, the PCI DSS, or when I was working with a healthcare. And I did, in case in point, I did see a healthcare or was involved in investigating a healthcare data ransomware attack um, where uh, they threatened to expose the business to penalties under multiple data laws. And in, their, in, in their case, it was their acquirer, their acquiring bank, which they would then also increase their fines and penalties. Uh, all the while, they had stolen healthcare data, but they could use it to leverage that threat and leverage the intensity of that threat and the liability against um, against that particular business to pay the ransomware significantly because they had all this additional leverage. So I think that's you know healthcare data is so important because it it can merge and reflect and affect uh, many different sectors and segments. So that's that's an interesting point because it it moves into the second portion of the slide, which is uh, what the data can be used for. Now, you know, I grew up in the financial fraud space, so for me, it's always been financial fraud. Let's make money off of this, uh, uh, whatever it is, a credit card, a login to a financial institution, whatever it is. Uh, but when you look at the type of data that healthcare where healthcare provides the attackers, you can see all kinds of different uh, uses uses of or usages of this type of data. Um, which kind of uh, also, of course, affects the, the price of this type of data in the criminal underground. I mean, healthcare data is sold for much more than a credit card. Today, credit cards on criminal undergrounds, you can find them for less than a dollar. If you're paying three to five dollars, you better get a very good pre you know, premium card or, or you're just paying too much. Not that I'm saying that you should, of course, uh, do these actions. Um, in some cases, they just give out these credit cards for free, where when it's talk you talk about healthcare data, the price for patient data is around the $50 mark. When you're talking about intellectual property, it jumps way, way up, which brings the question of who is doing this and what is their motivation, right? Because uh, if you look historically at, at financial institutions who were the first ones to get target, uh, targeted, uh, you had all these kinds of uh, um, small time rather hackers, then you, they grew into cyber crime rings uh, that uh, have pretty sophisticated operations. Uh, they want to get as much information, credit cards, or even access to the networks as possible. And then, you know, we saw the uh, more targeted, advanced, persistent threat type of threat actors uh, come into play. And I think, um, and again, you guys tell me if, if, if you see this from your perspective, we're seeing the same type of evolution in the healthcare uh, sector. We're absolutely seeing the same evolution, uh, Italian. And, and what's interesting is we've just sent hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers home to work remotely uh, with access to this same kind of protected information. And, and uh, if we've got any iOS 14 beta testers out there, you're getting the alerts that say, uh, the, your, this application is reading your clipboard and that's any iOS device or, or Mac device. And so if, if we send someone home with a, with a corporate iPad, for example, but they have a personal iPhone, because of the way uh, Apple devices connect and talk to each other, we have applications that are reading your clipboard and if they're within 10 feet of each other, they're sharing that information. And so all of a sudden the corporate device is the personal device, which is the corporate device. And so we didn't even know we were doing this. The bad guys don't even have to do anything. We're giving it to them without even knowing. Yeah, it's, you just touched upon a very sensitive issue for me. Uh, you know, just a couple of days ago, I, I take my own personal iPad at home and I see there's an application that my daughter likes to use. I'm not going to mention the name, but it, may, it, it rhymes with click clock. And, uh, and what you mentioned is, uh, is something that was also found out in several researches, right? That some of these applications, uh, they just take whatever you copy to the clipboard and send over uh, uh, to their servers and, you know, wherever they may be. 
so yeah, there's there's this whole issue of of, uh, of working from home now that we'll we'll actually touch upon in in the next couple of slides. Um, I'm sure some of the people here on the on the call uh, have seen these kind of headlines that hackers pledge that no healthcare attacks during coronavirus outbreak. I think I I, I took this screenshot um, uh, about two months ago, three months ago. Um, and then you see on the right hand side what is the uh, actually the Maze ransomware group and some of their uh, advertisements. And um, I mean, we've seen these types of attacks against healthcare, ransomware attacks against healthcare happen uh, for, se for several years now. Um, but from your perspective, do you think the, the attackers have any concern at all that, you know, it's, it's a worldwide pandemic? If we do something around the healthcare industry, there's going to be, you know, we're going to have to pay for it? Well, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing with this, Itai, that is just, kind of odd in the grand scheme of things when you uh, on one hand you know we've had everyone from the state department to reporters saying hey hands off healthcare right now and anyone that's ever spent any time on the security side of things kind of chuckles at that saying you know look there's there's no humanity here on the part of an attacker if they can make a buck they're going to make a buck but that's not what we're seeing right we're we're actually seeing an environment where a hospital was going down about every one to two days last, I mean, every one to two weeks last year, getting locked up with ransomware to the point at which they have to divert patients. And all of a sudden COVID-19 comes around and it all stops. Now, that doesn't mean reconnaissance isn't happening. In fact, all signs are that the odds that attackers have a beachhead inside of healthcare is probably only increased due to the increased vulnerabilities that have come into play as we respond to COVID-19. But for some reason, we're not seeing the detonations, particularly with ransomware. Now, there are a few examples. Uh, there was even an example, uh, you know, over the last few days, but certainly not at the same frequency we've seen historically. Now, there's one of really two theories to explain this. Either A, let's not forget that bad guys are also impacted by COVID-19 in some cases, their quarantine, they may have relatives that are affected. Maybe, truly, there's some humanity here. Or, just as likely, they're realizing that all eyes are looking at healthcare right now. And they're realizing that maybe now isn't the time to go attack healthcare because law enforcement, uh, intel agencies, and the entire security community is watching this closely. And maybe they don't want to draw additional attention to their efforts. There's no way of knowing for sure, but we're definitely seeing the attacks are down, at least for the moment. And you mentioned another thing that's interesting, Caleb, now, um, you know, the physical outcome of an attack like this, where patients have to be diverted. Usually when, when we talk about these things, we always talk about the data and, you know, consequences of, of credit card theft or intellectual property. And, and you're actually mentioning that hospitals had to divert patients because of these types of attacks. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, that, you know, when you lose access to your electronic health care records, you often don't have a choice but to divert because you have no access to patient history and you don't even know the schedule of who's about to walk in the door for an elective procedure. So generally speaking, other than, you know, kind of urgent emergencies, most hospitals start diverting and in many cases actually divert their ER to other hospitals. Um, you know, the other thing we have to kind of keep in mind here is this is this pandemic is having an impact on the attacker as well their business kind of blew up i mean think about it if you had invested a lot of time in attacking let's say the travel industry which is one of the top most attacked industries last year no point going there there's nobody traveling anymore if you were looking at retail ah traditional retail nobody's going into stores it's all online um airlines ah, no point wasting your time there so remember, the bad guys have had to pivot their businesses as well. And what business is still open? What business still has an economic impact? What business has a potential impact if you're looking at some form of activism? It's all about healthcare. So the challenge here for healthcare is you have all the same challenges of the past, but you're now a much more likely and lucrative target. Yeah, and actually, you mentioned something which will uh, um, transition into the next slide, which is uh, medical records. So what we're looking at here is actually 
there was like no hacking involved, no anything nefarious that has been done to obtain these types of, of uh, uh, screenshots. What you're actually looking at here on the left side is, is results from a, a website called Shodan. Those of you who are not familiar with Shodan, Shodan is a search engine, uh, but it indexes uh, uh, devices and websites. So you can actually search for specific uh, devices, specific protocols, uh, specific services. And um, it is extremely easy to actually go and start searching for uh, open EMR or any uh, kind of EMR uh, uh, systems that are out there. Now, I know in some cases, you know, people think, hey, we installed this. This is for the doctors uh, to gain access into and, and collect information. Um, nobody will ever find it. It's, it's, it's on one of our servers. But if you put something on a server in, in, in your uh, organization and you open a door externally for your users to come in, well, the same door can be knocked on uh, by attackers uh, as well. Um, so these types of, of systems, now I, I know David, for example, you mentioned OpenEMR is just uh, uh, one example, but there's there's a lot of these, right? Absolutely, and, and most large organizations are using a, a, a more traditional uh, on-prem kind of solution, not an open source solution. But one, one of the interesting things, and it uh, reminds me of, a, of another day when, when I was at another organization and we used to find all these big EMRs have patient portals and people are logging in and one of the most common finds on on the dark web was the patient credentials and we would notify the the hospital because their name is in that credential somewhere and and they would say well that's that's not a credential to our systems that those are our patients and and we recognize that but they can't really do anything except get into their EMR. And, and the problem with that is people are using the same logins that, you know, their emails, probably their, their username, and, and then they're using the same password. So they've now taken your patient information and are gonna figure out who their insurance carrier is and, and who their bank is and work backwards through the system and including likely back into your system somehow. So we again, it's thinking about what we're giving people access to and why those credentials are important and why providers should be paying attention when stuff is found on the dark web. Right. And, and, and you just described something that we see a lot of, and actually we've seen a significant increase of during this uh, pandemic, and that is uh, credential stuffing attacks, where attackers will take old database, even very old databases, uh, with username and passwords or email and passwords. And there's just so many of them out there in the open. You don't even have to go into the uh, dark web. You can just go on Google and search for some of them and you can and you can find username and passwords. And then what they do is they uh, take a system like um, OpenBullet, which is uh, uh, an open source tool, and they feed it all those username and passwords. And then they go to one of these websites, like an open EMR so solution or a Zoom conferencing solution or whatever it is they want to target. And they start testing these username and passwords, and and that's and what they res, the result is they get positive replies back from the uh, uh, from the system, and then they create a database and they say, okay, now I have a, a for sale a database of uh, users that I know will work on this specific you know EMR system, and they sell it, uh, and we'll see some of these batches a little bit later on, but that's that's the big problem with. People who use uh, um, who reuse passwords, and I'm not gonna, not, I'm not going to even start my whole thing about how I hate passwords <laughs> and the fact that you know trying to have a sophisticated password usually means that you will take that sophisticated password and use it everywhere, which makes it very unsophisticated. Um, but that that's a big problem with reusing passwords or using easy to guess passwords. But this is just uh, uh, one example. Here you can see examples of systems um, that are vulnerable. Uh, and again, this is nothing uh, Nothing nefarious was done here. This is again from a system like Shodan where you can search for uh, systems and you will find vulnerabilities. The, the search engine itself will actually tell you this server that you're looking at has these vulnerabilities. Um, and you can see here CVE 2015. This is a software vulnerability that is five years old now and is still on this system. Now, I know it's really easy for me as a security person to say, hey, patch all your systems 
and I don't want to see any vulnerabilities and everything has to be up to date. And if it isn't, then just wipe it and start from fresh. Uh, but uh, it's it's not that easy, I guess, for hospitals and, and clinics, right? It is, and it gets very complicated, but but I, I just want to go back to the patch all because it's my favorite weakness in, in uh, we're going to get into DICOM, but, but uh, the PAC systems, uh, it was only a year ago, and healthcare has a very short memory in terms of security and privacy, but a security researcher found a vulnerability in the DICOM image format, which is how, which is what PAC systems share. And, and it's a, I, I don't want to call it a bug because it's just a flaw in the original design of DICOM, which is a 30 year old standard, but it allows you to insert uh, malicious code in the header of that DICOM image. And because it lives within the DICOM image, it, it is never found by scanners. You can put executable code in that header and, and it really complicates things because the image is part of a legal medical record now. So you can't, if you do find it, you can't just get rid of the DICOM image because that's a legal medical record, even though it has malware in it. And, and so while this hadn't been exploited yet, it, it is a huge hole waiting to be taken care of. And it's in a healthcare specific protocol. Uh, DICOM is found within virtually every healthcare organization, and it allows attackers to increase increase the stealth spread and, and their overall effectiveness by exploiting not just the technical flaw, but the actual workflow and clinical regulatory issues. And, and so we have to be extra careful with our, our PAC systems and, and DICOM images, in my opinion. Yeah, that's and what you mentioned, I just moved while we were talk, you were talking to the uh, DICOM uh, uh, slide here. So we actually see two different levels of sophistication, so to speak, uh, where attackers can attack these systems. So on the bottom here, I'll start with mine, and then I just want to address what you said. Um, you see here an access to a, a system where the default username, actually, when you go to their screen, the default username is already there. And the password is not very hard to guess. It's, it's, it's five characters long. And if you know the user, you probably know the password. So, you know, these easy to guess passwords, uh, whether they are uh, one through eight or uh, uh, whatever it is, root or admin or, or password one, two, three, uh, make it extremely easy for attackers to gain access. But what you just said is kind of like mind blowing, but having a vulnerability that allows the attacker to actually put malware within your system is again it's on, on the one hand it's mind blowing to me but again it's it's something that i know it's not easy to say okay take everything down and and you know redistribute a new a new system but you know there's another piece of this too itai which is that you know you're finding these access points just through some basic searches right you're not doing anything exotic here and i and I think one of the things people need to recognize as they're listening to this conversation is that this can very easily happen to you. And, and yeah, you kind of look at it and go, oh, none of my people are dumb enough to have a password as admin or password one, two, three. Well, you don't really know that until you check. And, you know, I, I hope one of the things people walk away from here is not only do you need the policy in place, but it's really important and the best practice here is to actually go look in these places. You know, how do your, does your company, how does your network appear on Shodan? How does it look when you go look in the dark web? And, you know, if you don't have the people capable of doing that in-house, uh, there are plenty of people that you can hire to go do it. But it's a really important thing to monitor and look at. Caleb, you raised the point here that is something that I encounter a lot and I want to mention, and that is, you know, the attacker doesn't view the network the way you view your network. They view it in a different way. And uh, you know, there, when you talk about, for example, threat intelligence, there's always three questions that I discuss uh, with security leaders. It's what do you know about your enemy or your adversary? What does the adversary know about you? Which are kind of the classic security questions. But then the third question is the one that's really tricky and interesting, and that is what you just mentioned. What do you know about yourself? And I want to give you just one quick example, and I'm sure it applies in, in healthcare as well. You know, you go to any organization now, 
and you take the head of the HR and the head of IT, and you ask that organization, how many employees does your organization have? You're going to get two very different answers. Because HR will say, well, we have a thousand employees in this hospital, so uh, we have a, a thousand contracts on record, so we have a thousand employees. And then IT will say, well, we have 1,500 users on our Active Directory, so we have 1,500 employees. So where's the difference from? Oh, well, you know, when Jack uh, uh, once wanted to test a new DICOM system, we opened another user and we never really closed it. And, and when Kathy left uh, uh, to go to another job, we forgot to close one of her users. And that's that's how the attacker views your network, not necessarily how you look at it. So it's really important to, to try and view these things from the um, attacker's perspective. Now, I want to move along here and, and share uh, several examples of uh, deep and dark web findings. And we'll do the first ones a, a little bit uh, uh, faster, and then I'll, there, the last one is the one I want to kind of take some time to discuss. Um, but you, what you're looking at here are several uh, underground offerings from the dark web. Um, this one specifically from a, a Russian forum, so uh, we had it uh, translated. Um, and you can see that they sell access. They don't just sell credentials of users or patients. They actually sell the access to the clinics and to their uh, information. Um, these types of offering, uh, in this case, actually, this came from a website that actually does this uh, as, as an auction. So they put them up and within less than 24 hours, they're, they're gone, they're sold. Somebody buys this and and uses it in, in one way uh, or another. And now these slide sites, as opposed to the ones we've seen so far, uh, you do need to understand how to get access to them. These are not really publicly open. Some of them require special software. Some of them, as you see in this case, require uh, some uh, knowledge of, of different languages in order to conduct this type of uh, intelligence collection and, and, and discussion with the criminals. But these are, are, are kind of all over the place and we see them all the time. And you can see here in the last line, it says domain admin rights. So actual privileged access into these uh, uh, systems. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to mention anything about this before I move to another example. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I know we're, we're gonna go a little deeper in this, but it, it does point to the issue in healthcare that we're Historically, we haven't really thought much about who attacked us or, or why or, or where my data is. We are so uh, in, in that defense posture, and yet we have to understand in the new world, uh, when we start thinking about these questions, it actually makes it easier to, to, to protect ourselves, to get ahead of these. A lot of times these are attacks. We know they're out there. If we knew this, we could make the changes to address that. So this is going to be a pivot for, for healthcare as we move from defense to understanding our attackers and what other organizations are saying about us. Our CEO can tell us everything about our competition, but we can't uh, tell you who's coming after us. And, and that's got to change. I completely agree. Um, you, know, you know, there's another thing here too, though, that, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of going to be a little bit repetitive in my points here. So, you know, take a few of these examples where they're calling out specific institutions and ask yourself, are you looking in these forums for your data? Do you have anybody that's constantly scouring the dark web, looking for your patient's data, your private information up there? Because you need to. And what you want to do with that is not just take a look to see if somebody's selling it, but you actually want to use a concept called tracer data, where you're ingesting a little bit of fake records into your data sets in different places. So, you know, the, the North Carolina hospital has one set of tracer data, which is different than, uh, you know, maybe your hospital in Georgia. So that if you lose data or if you see one of these places for sale, you can tell immediately, A, is the data mine, and B, where did it get leaked from? Very simple, easy thing to do, but a best practice that can really make a difference when you're looking at these dark web forms. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, you know, there's a lot to be said about learning from uh, those who have already been attacked and are uh, in, in very mature stages. Uh, Caleb, what you mentioned, uh, the tracer data can also be used, for example, uh, internally. 
uh, meaning for uh, if you're um, concerned about access to your networks, well, we know that attackers like to do what's called privilege escalation. They want to take ownership of accounts that have access to a lot of different things. So here's another idea, very similar to what Caleb just mentioned. You can create a, a user within your a, a, a network. I don't know, give them some name, super admin user. Of course, not something that stupid, but super admin user for our example. And you don't give them privilege to anything. You just constantly monitor that user. And you know that if anybody tries to touch that user, meaning somebody tries to guess the username and password for that user, you know that you have somebody bad on your network because nobody has that user. It's not supposed to be used for anything. And somebody just triggered uh, this type of, of alarm. Um, I'm looking here at uh, uh, a couple of other examples from, uh, these are all dark web examples. You can see prices here are in uh, sold in uh, Bitcoins. Um, and you can see here everything from, well, in this in this case, previously was healthcare data. Now you're talking about pharmacy uh, customer database. So this is mostly um, emails, uh, passwords, but it, of course it doesn't just end with hospitals and, and clinics. You have pharmacies. This is this one is, is a bit interesting before we move to the last example, which is the one we'll kind of deep dive into. Um, this person uh, claims to have access uh, to uh, scans that will allow you physical access into um, into a hospital. Um, so all kinds of scans that will allow you to create the plastic card. Now, unfortunately, social engineering and getting access into different places is not all that difficult. And it becomes a lot, you know, we, uh, uh, Caleb and I used to talk to penetration testers and they used to joke that, you know, whatever, all everything that you need is a hard hat or a yellow, uh, one of those uh, uh, yellow uh, shirts or uh, just high a high visibility control. vest. Sorry? A high vis vest. Yes, that or I, I remember one that said all you need is just a box of donuts, actually, right? Um, and and yet now it's made easier because we'll, with access to this type of thing, you actually have physical access into into uh, uh, the hospital. Uh, so again, What's another thing, the cat. I don't know. I don't know why the cat is there. Uh, I, I mean, like every like I mean, this is the thing you know just you know, gives you some more credence that yeah, this is actually real stuff. Like. You know, you've got prices up here, you've got details, and then you got this crazy picture of a cat, which I have no idea why this is on there. <laughs> Cats and the internet. It's 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 a it's a long relationship. <laughs> um, the, cat, the cat was later found in the hospital's pharmacy, by the way. So <laughs> it was no that community in access. <laughs> But the one I do want to—I uh, 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 mean, I'm skipping here because again, we're we're, uh, we're I want to be conscious of time. I want to talk about this screenshot, which actually came from somebody who was selling credentials on the criminal underground and actually claimed to have access to a computer by a, that is owned by a doctor. And he shared this screenshot with us. Now, I have to say, I put those two red arrows to point out to two things that immediately jumped out at me when I looked at it. But, you know, you can basically put in a red arrow just about any, any, any one of these folders here. Um, and it really shows you again the the whole you know notion of you know working from home access to somebody's computer can it doesn't have to be access to the uh, uh, hospital's network maybe that is even guarded maybe the the personal computer of of the uh, clinician or the doctor is open and and Caleb I thought you wanted to say something was it David well I love this image because it just tells a story now first of all we obviously aren't disclosing who this is but. They appear to be a little bit uptight, right? I mean, they've got things very well organized, everything from their Christmas card list to, you know, scans. And I tend to think this is definitely a laptop versus a server, again, because we see, see things like business cards and Christmas folders on here and things like that. But remember, they've made it easy for the bad guys to figure out where the crown jewels are. But what I'm more concerned about is as uptight as this in person is about thinking about how to organize their life, what they're not thinking about is how to segment information to protect it. Like by getting access to this one machine, you've got access to all kinds of things, everything from, you know, refunds and referring doctors and protocols to, to medical scams. And what we really have to take away from this is two things. One, this information should never be stored on your personal laptop. Put it in a secure cloud storage or someplace where if you lost this laptop, it, it's not going to get stolen. 
The second thing that really strikes me here is it's not encrypted. And I guess I'll add a third thing in here because we're, you know, in the world of COVID-19, but, you know, this could very easily be a shared workstation at home where, you know, maybe this individual copied all this stuff down from their work machine because now they're stuck at home working on a shared workstation and, you know, Junior's playing games on this thing later in the day and that becomes the new way in which all of this stuff gets hacked. And I mean, I'm looking here at the wireless credit card machine. I mean, I'm looking at a lot of things here. I don't know if you notice there's some files here which are archived called company data. It's like, <laughs> this is like just calling for the thief. Um, uh, Chris, a uh, wireless credit card machine, I'm assuming this person has some sort of uh, uh, credit card machine that they charge through. But this, uh, you know, not just the healthcare issue, we're talking here about PCI DSS issues. Yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely, and, and that's a good point to note, Itai, because we're definitely talking, uh, we're definitely looking at uh, an overlap of, of responsibilities and also liability from the standpoint of the data that you have out there. I mean, it's, it's, I totally agree with everyone, Caleb, and, and, the, and all of us, that this is, this is, this is telling so many different stories as an example. Um, but it, you know, definitely, uh, when I was mentioning earlier, the overlap between different regulatory liabilities that you may face. Um, just it points back to a, a, a different problem, really, and it's and it's it's something that I mean, in healthcare, it's you know you go through and assess systems from security, and you should be doing a risk assessment. But part of that, and this is also done within uh, retail as well. You know, when we're talking PCI DSS, one of the major uh, parts of that is is conducting the risk assessment, and one of the things that you have to do during that is figure out what your BAUs are. So you're 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 essentially looking at your business as usual processes. And part of that is how in the heck and where, who, what, when, where, and how of data. So if you use data for any particular, uh, however you use it, as it relates to your business and the risk that that poses on your business, you're calculating that in the risk assessment. And I think that this, you know, this example is perfect because it, 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 it shows that really it's, it's more or less, I'm gonna be really organized and that's fantastic, but um, I've got everything in there. So I'm not really totally sure uh, what data I need and how that affects my business and whether it should be there in the first place. And if a proper risk assessment is conducted, and I know it's an easy thing to say, again, you know, I'm taking the, I'm taking the page of, as Itai said, as a security professional, hey, that's uh, security 101, you should be doing a risk assessment. You should be putting data, uh, data carry files out there and, and making sure that uh, the answers to those and, and your insider threat points back to your security awareness program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very easy as me as an auditor to say, but really, even if we take the step of analyzing just why do we have this data? Are we, should we be using this or should we be putting it out there or should we be even using this in the first place? Um, that's it. That's it. The, the answer to that question can help us um, uh, alleviate a lot of the liability that may, we may face uh, overlapping and from a healthcare data perspective, because as we're seeing through this whole presentation, you know, if we look at the uh, cognitions of a of an attacker or or the cycle that they follow, um, you know, maybe they're not being ethically <laughs> kind at this moment. They might be just changing their target, because um, there's as we've seen from all the last slides, there's a ton of really valuable and easy attainable data that they can grab. Uh, doing reconnaissance and collection that they can use later on and then stay out of the spotlight. And I, I, get, I don't want to put David on the spot here, but just a quick question. You know, when I look and see here, like employee data, uh, stuff like this, is this something you would expect to see on, 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 on somebody's laptop or is that something usually healthcare organization keep somewhere else? No, that would typically be in, a, in, in another system. And Itai, this is the image that made me drop my head into my hands and gasp and just shake my head. And, and this comes down to, to lots of issues, but, it, but it's, it's, it's partly training and it's partly making sure people understand that there are other locations for this kind of thing. Employee data should not be here. Uh, actual patient scans should not be on on your laptop. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things that are uh, just wrong, including archiving stuff to your own desktop that doesn't make any sense since since laptops uh, disappear and and get taken. Uh, there, there is so much wrong with this uh, image that it's it's horrifying. 
Well, um, and I think there's one other thing to keep in mind here too, right? Which, let's face it, we all like to do work at home. We all like to keep copies of things we've worked on and things like that. And, and you know, two things. One, I think we also all have to become a little more in tune to where are we storing our data and realize that secure cloud services are really easy to access. You can get access to the internet pretty much anywhere now. So you really don't need a copy of everything on your laptop anymore. So that's one. But two, the big difference here is a lot of this also likely involves regulated data. And we all talk about it, we've all heard about it, but the penalty and consequence for losing this data is real. Uh, and this becomes an important employee education point of we have to look at certain types of data as being a little bit like a nuclear asset. We need to treat it like a nuclear asset and handle it with care. And, and you know what, uh, uh, one last thing before we move on, I, I, wanna, I will play the devil's advocate here for a second as, as hard as it is for me to do as a security person and say that we also have to keep in mind that we have to give the users the capability to work. Uh, and it's it's becoming difficult, you know, with everybody working from home. But if you put more and more regulations in place, but don't provide the user a way to work and keep their daily uh, routine, then all of a sudden everybody becomes a hacker, right? And we've seen this happen in the past in the case, for example, of USBs, where companies said, you know what, we, we know there's these bad USBs around, no more USBs. You can't bring any USBs. Uh, we're we're uh, stopping all the USB ports on your computers. A day after something like that is implemented, uh, that company will start seeing a lot of their presentations, Excel files, personal files, go into you know Gmail or Dropbox or wherever, uh, because that's now how the uh, users are, are working. Everybody becomes a hacker to find ways around it. So while we have to keep to these security uh, uh, hygiene uh, uh, standards, we also have to keep in mind that we need to allow uh, um, the users to complete their work and do their daily work and, and give them how, also what, what to do, not just what not to do. Yeah, um, Ita, I completely agree. I, I used to tell my IT staff that no is not an answer. And if the answer is no, you have to have a solution for them. But telling people they can't do stuff, particularly physicians and nurses, I guarantee you they will find a way around it. You have to give them a secure alternative. And um, we have about five minutes left because I do want to leave five minutes for Q&A. So we'll take a look at a couple of other um, examples that we have here. Um, uh, these one from out of the open. I'll jump pretty quickly through uh, some of these, uh, but there is a couple that I will stop and ask you a couple of questions. So what you're looking at here is actually an elastic search, so an elk uh, search. Um, these are databases that are just out there in the open. Again, no username and passwords uh, were used to access this. This is just misconfiguration, um, which, uh, you know, when you talk about security, misconfiguration is not a sexy term, right? It's not, there's no zero days, there's no amazing hacks here, but it's the simple stuff that will actually give the attacker uh, a great foothold into a system or into uh, uh, information. and you know, this this is something that has been addressed, whether it's it's stuff like this, which is um, uh, misconfiguration or keeping open ports. Uh, what you're looking at here is a healthcare organization with uh, SMB service on. SMB uh, is actually the way that uh, WannaCry, if you remember from a couple of years ago, the ransomware, that's how it distributed itself through uh, open uh, SMB ports. And even stuff like this, where you see a children's hospital and the FTP server is, is just open. Um, these types of things are, are, you know, an issue when we talk about the classic financial IT world. How does how do uh, hospitals approach this, especially at a time like this? You know, uh, where uh, David, as you said, you know, no is not an answer. Give, give an answer to people. But on the other hand, now we are living in this emergency situation where, well, there's patients' lives. Uh, I need to open whether it's an FTP port or an SMB server or connect to this third party and buy uh, uh, PPEs off them. Patients' life over, you know, the, the, the priority is way higher than IT security at that moment in time. So how do you approach this kind of, of problem? That's a great question. And, and you're right. The, the patient always is going to be the priority and, and that's right and proper. But we have to have ways when we get through this crisis, uh, whatever that crisis is, but when we get through COVID-19, we've got to go back and clean up. We've got to have processes 
and monitoring and tools in place that will tell us when we've missed stuff. We've got to check the controls that we think we put in place, but for one reason or another, they got readjusted. Maybe these things got turned off during an upgrade and didn't get turned on. That, that will always happen, but you have to have the controls in place and the monitoring to know when something got missed. Uh, but you have to do what you have to do in the moment. You just have to make sure you have the cleanup and the routine inspections, the routine monitoring, the routine risk assessments. The assessment of your risk can never stop in terms of security or privacy. Okay, I'm going to jump over this right into this because I know um, uh, uh, Chris has a couple of words about this, and these are end of life uh, uh, systems and and some uh, stats. And you know, from the security perspective, from the attacker perspective, end of life systems are awesome, right? Because any vulnerability by default is now a zero day. Nobody's going to patch it. Um, and and unfortunately, a lot of times these systems exist in areas where it's really hard to patch or switch systems, whether it's um, oil refineries or critical infrastructure, or as we see here also in, in healthcare. So Chris, um, do you want to say a couple words about this? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's too many words I could say about it, and I could not do any uh, presentation based on a security of healthcare without mentioning uh, Windows end of life. And I'm not, by all stretches, I'm not picking on, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, ask to comment on this because I want to pick on uh, Microsoft Windows. Uh, it's just a really good example to use. Uh, and from the hacker side of things, as Itai's saying, as Itai's saying, I mean, it's it's a goldmine. Uh, and it has been for a long, long time. As a security professional, I've also um, seen the fruits of, uh, you know, end of life systems for a long time as well. And I think all it is, is, is really, you know, you look at the stats and it's pretty alarming. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these systems are well embedded uh, against critical systems within healthcare. Retail is afflicted, finance is afflicted. I mean, it's an ongoing uh, issue. But I mean, really, the big thing around here is, um, you know, as as we're saying during the presentation, ongoing risk assessment and just even um, small assessments on on uh, how you're perceived uh, within the exploit community. I.e., uh, you know, how do you have any sense of how at risk you are, even if you have inventory, a simple inventory of systems uh, such as unsupported systems in this case, uh, these, you know, uh, any of these systems. I mean, that obviously puts you more at risk and, it, and you don't really have to take major steps to be able to uncover this. So it's, you know, I mean, I see this, you know, whenever I talk about this, I see it as uh, this is a this is an opportunity to take a small step and get a quick win because even if you have some sort of reference on how many of these systems you have in your environment, I mean you're one step further to understanding how at risk your systems are. And if they're end of life or unsupported, well you're at quite a lot of risk for those particular systems. So it's a small step to get a very very large win, especially within healthcare. And. I want to I want to keep make sure that we're on time and we have some time for questions. So I am going to skip a couple of other examples that we had here, mostly around how to um, map some of these threats. Uh, but before we go into Q and A, I just kind of want to go back and circle back for uh, uh, with everybody here. What would be kind of like the one takeaway you want the uh, you know the audience from this session to to take from everything? I mean, I know we talked about a lot of different things and a lot of different aspects. And I know I'm only asking for one specific thing, but if we do Caleb, David, Chris, and then myself, what is the one thing you want everybody to kind of keep in their mind after they uh, uh, we finish this session? Well, you know, from my perspective, this is Caleb, I, I think the biggest thing is as you're thinking about, you know, most of the times as security professionals, we think about defense, right? What tools do we have in place? Whose eyes do we have on glass? You know, I think you need a little offense here too, in that it's important to have part of your program is going out to look in these forums for your data or your peers' data, to understand how it got there and how it's being exploited. Because the more you understand about the actor, the campaign, and the motivation, the more you can protect yourself because you understand what you're up against. I would agree with Caleb and, and add the caution that if you've not done it, uh, don't dive into it without knowing what you're doing. Uh, you should find out how to do these kinds of explorations. You should uh, have partners who you work with. 
and and what you find may not always be actionable or or ethical so it is a different approach to security but it is intelligence about your your enemy your attacker uh, about what people are doing with your data that's important to know and understand yeah, and I would I would build on uh, both Caleb and David's uh, points um, around uh, taking those first steps. And really, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to lean back on basically what I said around addressing uh, unsupported systems. Is look for the quick wins. And there are a lot of you know I'll, I'll, I always refer to frameworks. Um, you know, I've mentioned PCI in this presentation many times, but the PCI Data Security Standard uh, is a pretty prescriptive standard. And it, not that I'm <laughs> making an advertisement for it, but even choosing a simplistic framework to just start measuring yourself against um, can give you some of those quick wins so that you can at least ease your way into it. So, you know, I, and I think David's point is really, really profound in that a lot of organizations I deal with say, oh my gosh, everything's on fire. I just need to get this, this has to be all done tomorrow. Um, and we can't take that type of approach. And even though there's a lot of pressure on our industries, we do have to sort of ease our way into it and make sure that we're, we're, we're taking advantage of those quick wins. And if we rely on maybe even introducing some simple framework, security framework, to just get some measurables or create some quantitative metrics that we can uh, use to, to assign risk to the different areas within our, our enterprise and understanding our own enterprise first, uh, that can lead to some significant quick wins that we can then implement very quickly uh, into a full-blown um, security risk assessment and awareness program. And I'll finish by saying that, you know, uh, um, I, I, of course, I agree with everybody. Um, I think one thing that we need to look into here is, and one thing I want people to live with is those three questions that I mentioned around uh, threat intelligence. What do you know about the adversary, about their motives, why they're doing this, what they're after? What do you know that they know about you? Do they know of any vulnerabilities, any end of life systems, any open ports? And then what do you really know about yourself? Do you really do you really know all the devices that come into the hospital? Uh, issues that we even got to haven't gotten to discuss today, like shadow IT, somebody bringing in a laptop, connecting it. Do you really know your infrastructure that well? And you need to think about it and create kind of a security strategy around what are the, what is the threat landscape, what is the actor, and what is my network, and so how do I lower the risk of these types of attacks? Uh, but with that, I, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Caleb, David, uh, and Chris, and I think we have a couple more minutes just to take any questions, so I'll hand it over to uh, Megan. Thanks, Itai, Chris, Caleb, and David. That was a um, very interesting discussion, and we did get a few questions that I know um, we want to try to get to. I think Megan, we might have lost Megan. Uh, it appears so. We, we may have lost her, but we can still see the questions here. Um, yeah. I don't know if you know the answer to this one, but what insights do you have on the Ripple 20 track TCP IP vulnerability that was recently published since many medical devices use this TCP TCP IP stack? Uh, no, I do not have that. Something that I actually need to look into with our uh, researchers. Um, trying All right, to well, maybe we can get back to that person later. Um, Let's see for what other other things we have. Uh... Oh, they're talking about but, Windows. There was a comment here about Microsoft and Windows 7. Um, yes, you can pay occasionally on an outdated version of, uh, this is more of a statement, of a Microsoft operating system and get the patches. It's just technically end of life, just no more development. Th that's true to an extent. I, I think the, the piece you have to really look at relative to patching, first of all, is what's your patch frequency? You know, if nowadays we're in a road where if, if a patch is available because of a known vulnerability and you don't have your systems patched in a matter of days, you're really opening the door uh, to a potential attacker, especially when that vulnerability can be searched for using tools like Shodan. Um, you know, a great example of this is a bit of a dated one, but I mean, this was a great example was Equifax, right? I mean, a known vulnerability had been patched, they didn't have the patch rollout, and, you know, in no time at all, attackers were exploiting that. 
Um, you know, and where this is particularly problematic in healthcare is when we talk about medical devices, many of which have standard or non-standard operating systems that might be quite dated. You know, it's just incredibly important to have that inventory and keep those systems patched or that network completely segmented. Yeah, and I see here another comment, and I know we're going over time, so we'll end. We'll, I will just end with this comment, and it's a comment that I, I actually, it's, it doesn't look like a question, it looks more like a comment that um, doctors don't have the same security as hospitals do. And that's kind of, you know, something that we see with everybody today, right? People, sorry, somebody wanted to say something? Yeah, you, you've, you've pushed the button for me. Uh, the problem with healthcare and it was cited in a 2017 report to Congress from the Health and Human Services Task Force, and that is healthcare because of its hyperconnectivity is only as good as the weakest link. That's how security actually works anyhow. But healthcare is hyperconnected, and for a hospital to look at doctors using these kinds of standards and a lack of security is an open invitation to the hospital if you let doctors connect to you, or if you let patients connect to you, or if you let durable medical equipment or reference labs or diagnostic imaging centers connect to you, you are inviting them to bring the bad stuff with them. Every time you connect, you've created a new threat vector. So for us to push it off, we're all in healthcare and we have to solve this together. Excellent. I agree. Uh, I know we got Megan back. Megan, do you want to say a couple more things before we wrap it up? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I know there are a few more questions and um, we will reach out to you separately after the session. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for joining and have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Thank you.